Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. In the last week of April, Nepal's ruling Nepal Communist Party suffered a serious internal rift as rival factions within the party threatened to unseat Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli. As the intra-party rift escalated, the Chinese ambassador to Nepal held a series of meetings with top party leaders. According to local media reports, the Chinese ambassador requested that ruling party leaders maintain unity and avoid a split. Now, the rival factions have since backtracked and have now put up a united front on the controversial new map. Nepal's government on Sunday tabled a crucial constitution amendment bill to formalize the country's new map, which claims part of, uh, or rather parts of India as its territory. The principal opposition party has extended its support to the government, but the Madeshi parties are non-committal. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze Nepal's internal politics. Joining me on the program today are Manjeev Singh Puri, former ambassador to Nepal, Professor Swaran Singh, chairperson, Center for International Politics, JNU, and Major General Ashwini Srivach, retired defense expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, let me start the program with you. There has been a lot of churning that has taken place in the uh, political dynamics of Nepal over the last month and a half. How would you look back at what has happened politically in Nepal? Frank, thank you for having me at the program. Let me tell you this, that although the Nepal Communist Party won very handsomely in the elections held in December 2017, the fact is that the party was brought about as a result of unity between two major leaders. These particular factions continue to remain. Even in the erstwhile UML, the party to which Mr. Oli belongs, itself there were factions there. So what you have really seen is at the end of this particular period, now roughly two years, you're seeing these factions come to the fore, the kind of internal power struggles. Now, there are many... Con conversations of what seems to have happened. Uh, there was a kind of division between Mr. Oli and Mr. Prachanda. One would head the party, the other would do the prime ministership. Then there was co-chairmanship of the party. One would take on the prime ministership. So many of these things have happened. The net result is that there is contestation. And this contestation was certainly very rife about, as you said, a month or so back. OK. You know, Professor, since we are here, you know, these factions seem to have some way, uh, you know, somehow put their differences aside and come together. What has been the big factor that has bound all these factions together over the last couple of weeks? And they all seem to have put up a united stand now as well as far as the map is concerned with the opposition, also the principal opposition, the Nepali Congress, you know, extending support to the government. I think you are asking a very important question here. What makes all these different factions, including the opposition party, Nepali Congress, come together to push a certain agenda? Having problems uh, within the party, having factions, India is a democracy. We are used to parties having factions, parties having problems, uh, different claims being you know staked over a period of time. That's not what disturbs India. We are fine with that. Two things disturb us. One, that the facilitator of unity, in fact, the facilitator of unity even from the very beginning in 2016, has been our northern neighbor China. And Ambassador would vouch me the kind of uh, uh, intervention that we have seen the Chinese ambassador, how Yang Chi doing by traveling from one place to another to another, uh, constantly kind of ensuring that this government stays together makes the government perhaps a little obliged to what China wishes them to do over a period of time. That is what uh, disturbs us. And what we are seeing, and that's the second component of what disturbs us, is this whole, in order to save his own prime ministership, Prime Minister only is pushing this radical nationalist agenda, which is not difficult, uh, which is not easy for anyone to defy. All parties have to support any radical nationalist agenda. And we are seeing at least the Nepali Congress party, which initially asked for a certain amount of time, finally has come around. Madeshi parties, as you just mentioned, are still kind of uh, reluctant about these things. And that radical nationalism simply with the you know, very 
limited interest of saving is on prime minister he has already agreed to sort of change the prime minister to another person after covid 19 is over but that is what is pushing them to do such crazy things as middle of the covid 19 they are issuing a map they are using very foul language against india they are putting you know deploying you know police force to to create new posts on the border of so called claim so artificial creation of this additional territory on india at a time which does not help us understand why nepalese are doing this unless they are subservient to somebody else's interest and i think that is what disturbs us and not the fact that there are faction then there is instability politically inside nepal okay general general you know we've spoken about the political parties i'll come back to the china angle in just a bit but you know if you look at the other side of the spectrum uh, the general uh, of the nepali army in fact has said that he does not want to take part in this we should not politicize this particular issue and this issue should be resolved between india and nepal diplomatically and we should not you know up the rhetoric is what the Uh, general in nepal has said so what do you make of the statement of the nepalese general uh frank well, first of all we must understand that uh, as very rightly you said that as far as the uh, chief of army staff of india is the honorary uh, chief of nepal army and nepal chief is honorary uh, general of indian army so there are a lot of bondage between india and nepal you know there are 30000 uh, soldiers from nepal origins are serving in indian army uh, in various regiments now uh, so this bondage is of a great thing so whatever you know the command which was passed by by the chief of army staff uh, general nawane said that uh, whatever is being done by nepal is being done on the behest of someone else so directly the hint was toward china so whatever uh, you know uh, objection which was raised by by only government kp sharma only basically on this lipu lake road which is going from uh, dharchula to lipu lake and then further go to kak class mansrovar is in indian territory and so far uh, nepal has never raised any observation to that once it was being made or once you know these pilgrims were going so why have this been done now now this was the main question is it on the behest of china is it under the pressure of china when china is trying to show this pressure in ladakh so to that extent uh, general naramne has said that possibly on the behest of someone else was no one else but china but to me it looks like that that uh, you know what you said that uh, as far as the nepal uh, chief is concerned they have passed this command but i have read uh, on, on the other uh, website that they have denied it they said that no as far as the chief of army staff of nepal is concerned he is under the constitution and uh, whatever statement which have been given in the indian media is false so possibly what it looks like he is going to toe the line of the government of the day which is there today is a national communist party so we have to be careful and what we are saying but my point is we have to toe our line very carefully the issue is very sensitive basically that india and nepal enjoy cultural social economic political religious and military ties so therefore and these ties are very old so whatever decision which we take it we have to be very careful we cannot allow this problem to linger on now two things which stands out is we must understand this lipule karapani and limpudhura earlier the limpudhura was never been added by nepal now this is additional which they have added and this has been made as a part of nepal and shown wherein there about 90 square kilometer which is added earlier there was a dispute slightly on karapani because in 2015 when the china and india had agreed that lipu lake will be used as a trade route between both these countries nepal has raised a observation on that and because tacitly china has uh, given uh, you know okay that this is a part of india but this is very strange if that is the case as to why now china will put tremendous pressure on nepal to raise this issue this we have to see but all said and done uh, nepal is very close uh, friend of uh, of uh, india and at this time when we are trying to resolve our issue with 
China. We must not raise uh, the temper. We should try to resolve this issue uh, with uh, Nepal diplomatically and peacefully uh, immediately after COVID-19 so that the secretaries, foreign secretary can meet and sort out this because lingering on this okay. problem is not good for both the nation. Right. Okay, all right, Amb Ambassador. Yeah, go ahead, Ambassador. Thank you. Let me say a few things because I think uh, it's important for the viewers to get this idea right away. First, let me talk about the internal politics in Nepal. Let us understand quite clearly that the principal playbook in Nepal is anti-India, which masquerades as nationalism. Second thing, Nepal has always given play to geopolitics, especially when it comes to uh, things which are contestations with India. I mean, some place to China. But of late, I must tell you that the West is also quite active in Nepal. So let's understand this. Now, when we talk about who instigated, what instigated, let me tell you the situation within the Communist Party prior to the government taking up the map issue was one of great difficulty for the Prime Minister to hold on to his seat. And so, therefore, we mustn't under any circumstance undermine the fact that this is perhaps the best life-saving or seat-saving uh, thing that could have been done. It, of course, also affords him a great legacy as being a great Nepali because the Communist Party, frankly speaking, doesn't have any of these great legacies. Mr. Prachand takes credit for removing the monarchy, the Nepali Congress for ushering in democracy, etc. Now, this does not at all underestimate the role of the Chinese. Obviously, they had an interest in the matter. But let us not try to underplay the interest of saving yourself, the seat itself, and the domestic politics in Nepal. Having said this, let me make a small point to you about the, dis about the dispute. Now, look, in the area of Kalapani, for many years, there has been a small area in which there have been discussions between the two sides as to whether it is part of India or in Nepal. Nepal has laid claims to it. This is because the Kali River, which is supposed to be the westernmost boundary of Nepal, stops at a particular point. There are two tributaries which come there. Historically, it has always been the Kalapani tributary. And this area is somewhat to its right, as they say, a bit of the east. But that's a separate problem. What the Nepalese have done this time is to have said that the tributary further to the west of this particular place from where Kali starts is the real start of the Kali River and have hence added nearly 400 square kilometers. You know, that beak-like projection that you see, which is what is requiring them to actually amend the map because they have got the map as part of their emblem, their national symbol, and that is recorded in the constitution. Hence, the entire requirement of a constitutional amendment, which is now in process. The last point I want to make to you, and Professor Swan Singh made that very well. In Nepal, identity politics is not only vis-a-vis -vis India, but there's a strong identity politics within the country itself. But basically speaking, and we have seen it most recently, most strongly in 2015, when they adopted the new constitution of Nepal, that people who come from the hill areas, they always coalesce around a certain worldview of Nepal and the way they constitute their society. And so, really speaking, the Nepali Congress coming around on that was something which, in the end, one would have thought would have happened, and it has happened. The Madesi groups are now going to be actually challenged on their nationalism versus this particular thing. And Mr. Oli, in some senses, seems to have cemented his and his party's place as a great nationalist himself and a nationalist institution of Nepal. Absolutely. I think that's a very valid point, and these are very important uh, observations that you made, Ambassador. Let me take this issue of the Madeshi groups forward with the professor. You know, where does this leave the Madeshi groups, and are they now going to be facing a battle for survival going forward, and also in this battle of nationalism, the bigger battle of nationalism, Professor? Indeed, other than the Nepali Congress, which had, of course, traditional pre-independence links with Indian Congress, uh, and was seen as a kind of a India's uh, connection to Nepal. Madheshi parties have also become kind of India's concern. And you remember, India had strongly objected to the constitution that was already being adopted. Uh, Indian foreign minister now, uh, then I think foreign secretary, had visited there. 
and you know india's connection with madeshi parties have also at least been kind of a, a rankler you know uh, unnerving to some, several nepalese politicians and so now when madeshi parties are showing reluctance would again it would again be red x maybe india is kind of encouraging them to take a certain stance but two very quick things one that nationalism inclusive of anti india sentiment is common to all india's smaller neighbors what is different or additional in case of nepal is that being in in himalayas which itself is kind of geologically evolving river beds are constantly changing and we are talking here of 100 years we are talking of british treaties here right so if we are going to go back to british treaties you can imagine how river beds have moved the problem between china and india also right now is going on partly because of river beds have moved river beds move in addition if you look back not just one map but series of maps that british were making from middle of 19th century towards end of it there is also imperial what we call cartographic aggression that has happened over a period of time and it is a payback plan now only is doing exactly that he is doing cartographic aggression against india now based on the confusion as to which particular tributary of the kali river would be acceptable as the boundary line now issue here is not these cartographic legal historical complex complications issue is that india and nepal and the bastard wood vouch is lit there is a porous border you have about 600000 indians living in nepal there are marriages criss crossing all kinds of life is mixed up general mentioned about gurkhas 30000 gurkhas gurkha rifles in indian army about another 130000 gurkhas in nepal ambassador must have dealt with them the pensioners it's a kind of unusual relationship in way in which case the boundary demarcation looks very strange to be raked up like this that's what i'm saying it is not the issues it is the motivations of the ulterior motive behind the issues whether it is the chinese you know propping or encouraging and bolting some of these elites or is it the specific prime ministers trying to desperately save his own chair in fact all of us who you know have engaged with friends in nepal know that last several weeks there have been rumors of his resignation and his government falling and desperate attempts to somehow continue until next week so these ulterior motives is what is dangerous and my last point here is as ambassador just now said nepal's map is part of their national emblem and if it is once adopted as part of constitution it will be difficult for any future leader to then go back and say i'm going to compromise on that territory so i think india has to be careful and intervene at this stage when there is still something unclear about whether constitution amendment is going to take place or not because right, hands right. of successive leaders in nepal would be tied in making any compromise once that map is adopted as part of constitution becomes part of national and national emblem i think we have to really wake up and then respond in maybe in a hurry and these foreign secretary level talks one is hearing nepal is asking for pretty long time i understand both states are in middle of covid 19 but i think the way these things have been pushed from the nepali side requires india to wake up and engage it's possible that india is already engaging sometimes we are not aware of how india is engaging various uh, components in, in nepali's elite but i hope i really hope that indian side is engaging them and will at least find a way to postpone this whole issue of resolution for amendment coming in national assembly Okay, all right, General. I want to take up this issue of the Chinese uh, interest in Nepal with you. You know, traditionally we've seen that China has not openly played a role in politics in Nepal, but of late that has changed. I mean, we saw the ambassador of China to Nepal openly speak to the political parties in Nepal, and you know, play a very proactive role. How concerning is that, and why are the Chinese doing this at this point in time? uh frank uh, first of all before that i just want to touch upon this madeshi issue we must understand you know when we have uh, had a blockade in 2015 and uh, so the nepalese have blamed india government was involved in trying to help out the madeshi and madeshis are those in 1857 when there was a mutiny the nepal uh, has taken the side of the british army and british government thereafter as a tribute gave this area to uh, nepal after 1857 uh, 
uh, the, the part which was in, in India. So Madesis are the originally Indian uh, origin and they were given back, uh, given to Nepal after 1857. So that point has to be also taken into consideration that Madesis are more toward India than toward Nepal at times. And that is why we wanted to, uh, you know, see their interest and this blockade which uh, Nepal keep on blaming that India was totally involved in it. That was the basic reason. Now, as far as China is concerned, China is in a big way want to come in Nepal. That we must understand. The Xi Jinping has visited uh, Nepal in October 2019. He has signed two, three treaties. One is that uh, transit and, uh, you know, um, uh, and uh, transport agreement with, they have signed it. Basically, the supply line on which Nepal was totally dependent on India is now no more there. They will also able to now have some sort of trade through China. Second thing is that they are trying to now build a road which is coming from uh, Tibet, uh, Gorong, and coming to Kathmandu and then going toward the west in Pokhara and to the south which is going to Lumbiani. So therefore, this road which will be made will be in 25 years. It will cost $3 billion. And this will be a road which will have more than 90% tunnels, oblique bridges. So this is a, uh, you know, a question which has to be seen how difficult it is. But China has gone. So China wants to take Nepal in its own wings. China knows it. There are certain Tibetans, almost 30 to 40,000, which are there as a refugee in Nepal. It only wants that there should be no anti-China sentiments in Nepal by this Tibetan. Now, as far as uh, the other issue which is uh, concerned is why Nepal is not dependent on China than India. The reason is the Himalayas. That if you see the topography of Nepal, the Himalayas are a big hurdle between Nepal and China. The heights are ranging from 6,000 to 20,000. So therefore, the communication line from China to Nepal are very difficult. And hence, this $3 billion which road is been perceived to be constructed 25 years, we as Indians are perceiving that this will put China, uh, Nepal into a total debt trap of China because uh, Nepal is a poor country which has a GDP of $28 billion. They will not be able to pay as a soft rail. So there is a danger. So what is happening is the topography of Nepal is much more convenient toward India because it's tapering to the Gangetic Plain and then going from Nepal toward Gangetic Plain and going to Chittagong, I believe Calcutta from where the trade takes place is much easier R rather than right. they going toward China. But China notwithstanding this, to break this hegemony of India with Nepal, they are now saying from land long to land link. Now, that every time Nepal was considered as a land long country, now China is saying that China, uh, Nepal will be no more land locked, it will be land link with, with uh, China, and from there they will be able to take the port facility. Now, this point we okay. have to be very, very careful in future. Okay, all right. Time to get closing comments now from all my guests with the best way forward. So we are in a tight spot right now, Ambassador. How do we wriggle out of this? How do we engage? How do we be more proactive? Of course, India has said that we want to engage with Nepal. The offer has been made on several occasions. What's the best way forward, Ambassador? Frank, just a little point. The word land linked was used by us, by the way. This was in the context of our offering inland waterway services going all the way to Nepal. Now, look, the Chinese have always been players. They have been uh, kept constrained by technological abilities, by money abilities. They are rapidly overcoming these particular things. Just as the Chinese have an intent, or rather the Nepalese are asking the Chinese to build a railway line from the China-Tibet border, the Tibet border to Kathmandu and then on to Lumbini, so are we in the process and we have gone fairly ahead with building a railway line to Kathmandu. You know, these lines were never built in the old days simply because these are the young fold mountains. The change in geology, it's a very, very difficult track to build on. But now technologies allow you to do things. The way forward. Look, I'm very clear in my mind. Nepal and we enjoy special relations at the level of people. 
And yes, contestations with Nepalese political leaders have been happening right throughout 70 years. Let me remind you that brinkmanship is almost part of their psyche and the way they work. And there have been many such instances as difficult as today, even though now this time they're writing things in stone. But that's exactly what they did in 2015 when they enacted their constitution. So things always become more challenging. Absolutely no doubt about that at all. But the way forward continues to remain one of engagement. You need to engage at all levels, at political level, because we know them, we speak the similar languages. Uh, you need to engage them at the bureaucratic and specialist levels. And above all, ensure and see that these relationships, which have the advantage of both geography and the rich legacy of history, are used by everyone to move forward. Frank, before I close, oh. I want to make one small point. We are in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Nepal, 30% of its GDP is made up of remittances from overseas and about 20 to 25% of its population is overseas. Can you imagine the kind of economic impact that can happen? And just about the only economy with which Nepal can interact, legally speaking, historically, naturally, is the Indian economy and hence this is a time to try and work together and we should need to speak to them they need to speak to us but we need to speak in a constructive bilateral manner which seeks to ensure that the very strong public people to people relationship is leveraged for even greater strength especially at the times of the covid pandemic absolutely professor quick closing comment from you I think very clearly, I agree with the ambassador, India has multiple connections uh, in both society and elite of Nepal, whether it is media, intellectuals, politicians, uh, and officials. I'm sure we need to engage them, we need to explain to them how India-Nepal relations are completely unusual, and how much Nepal enjoys uh, benefits I sometimes say Nepalese in India have almost all the rights that Indians have in India, other than electing politicians to government, of, government offices. That unusual relationship is important. But you remember Ambassador also said they are now pushing the brinkmanship in the relationship. They are taking it to another level. And I think that would require, I think, unusual initiative. We all know yesterday Indian Prime Minister received a phone call from American President. And we understand perhaps that is an invitation for India to be to, to be invited as to become part of the G7 uh, summit meeting, right. which is postponed, which America is hosting. I think at some senior level like that, a, a kind of direct communication will be required at this stage to basically, as I said, ensure buying more time and making sure that resolution gets postponed and there is a space to maneuver. Because that is something we should definitely try and avoid and we should help Nepalese avoid it because they are being pushed into it, not because they want to claim that territory. You remember this. They are being right. pushed into doing this because of their own personal problems of staying in power. And I think okay. that if we understand that, then we can definitely help postpone this crisis and we'll have time to deal with it in future. As Ambassador said, we have dealt with these crises several times over. So this is not first time. But some high-level intervention, I think, is, is now uh, required at this stage. General. No, uh, Frank, two quick points. One is that, you know, whatever has happened in past is slightly different than what has happened this time. Two issues. One is that, you see, as what we are saying, 32,000 Gorkha soldiers are serving in the Indian Army. It becomes a sensitive issue if this case lingers on. And 101.25 lakh are the pensioners which are staying in, in Nepal of uh, uh, Indian Army. So this has become very important. We cannot let this problem linger on. It affects their morale. That we have to see. It. Second issue which we, we have to see it is that in case this amendment is passed in the parliament of Nepal, then going back becomes slightly difficult. Now, what is stopping us? Why can't we open the channel from foreign secretary to their foreign secretary or our prime minister to their prime minister? Talk it and sort it out. You know, the point is that the initiative lies with us. We are the big brother. We should feel because there is a sentiment in Nepal that, that India is a hegemonic country, which we should break. We should 
now take a step forward and try to resolve this issue before this amendment becomes uh, uh, you know passed in the parliament and becomes slightly difficult this is my okay. take and i only request to the government of india must take initiative as a big brother and resolve this issue before you know the things uh, become slightly in uh, uglier shape frank okay, one all right on that note instead yeah, of very quickly brother, ambassador I, do, i have limited time yeah instead of big brother elder brother General okay, sir. elder brother. All right. On yeah, that note, then I call it a wrap on this edition of the Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that I know it's summer, but we have to work together to ensure that we bring down the heat and not take it up. Is what the panelists are suggesting. Engage more proactively and at all levels, people to people, bureaucratic and political as well, and ensure that we move together uh, and move forward together because it is in. both the nation's interests that we do not have any kind of conflicts with that it's a wrap see you again next time